Uh, Steve and his wife, Sharon, are here with us. Um, I've gotten to know Steve the last couple of years working with ABT. Uh, Steve is part of the executive committee for Ethnos 360, or what formerly was New Tribes Mission. And I believe New Tribes has been going for 75 years. Yeah. Um, so Steve's father um, worked all his life with Ethnos 360. Steve came along, has poured his life into this ministry. Uh, you'll soon hear about their work in reaching an isolated tribe in, in Venezuela. And also, Steve has five children and one, three children. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry about that. That's right, that's right. Three children, and they are all um, missionaries uh, in other parts of the world. Um, so that's exciting. So Steve, you can tell us a little bit about yourself then. All right. But why don't we just have prayer? Okay. Father, we thank you. Um, thank you for the prayers that have already been offered up for both Steve here. Uh, Father, we ask that you would just bless this time. Father, what Steve is going to be sharing with us is just really critical, I believe, to to understanding the animist, understanding their worldview, and presenting the gospel in a way that that um, breaks through, that deconstructs their worldview and puts the truth in their hearts and their minds and enables them to, to live out uh, the gospel, to live out scripture, to live out the Christian life um, in their world. So Father, we ask that you would just give them wisdom. Give us clear minds. We've been sitting under a lot of teaching today and a lot of, a lot of stuff's been packed into our minds already. Father, pray that you would help us to, to think and stay awake in the process of this. So bless this time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon. It is a privilege for me to be here. Uh, I've been kind of associated with ABT now for three or four years, I think, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I have a deep appreciation for ABT and what ABT is about, the objectives, the uh, ministry philosophies. Uh, I feel like uh, we are two peas in the same pod, our organization and yours, when it comes to what we're all about. And not only what we're about, but the methodology that we believe in. <clears throat> and so, real privilege for me to be able to share with you this afternoon. I've been asked to talk to you about the topic on the screen, and I would like to launch right into it, because there's a lot to say about that and I don't want to use up too much of my time before I get into it. Let me, can I introduce you to my, to my family? Bryant mentioned I do have three boys. This is a couple years old now, but my wife Sharon is with me today in the back row there. Sharon, you might want to lift your hand. There you go. And uh, my oldest son and his wife and two daughters, our first two granddaughters, they are in the country of Papua New Guinea right now. They are, my son is actually, uh, in the bush right now finishing their house. It's almost finished. They have a co-worker, another, another family. Their two houses are almost done. A people group called the Konamala on the island of New Ireland in Papua New Guinea, an unreached people group, and they'll be starting their language learning and culture learning probably within the next couple of months. And my middle son, Tyler, and his wife, they have a, a baby girl now. She's about two months old, three months old. I never get it right. <laughs> She was four pounds when she was born. She's now 10 pounds. She's doing great. They are on their way to the uh, country of Indonesia next year. And then my, my youngest son is getting married next week. So a lot happening in our family. They, they plan to go be missionaries. They just haven't figured out where yet. Uh, but I would like to uh, introduce you to a people group this afternoon called the Hoti. They are located at the end of the arrow there in Venezuela, in the Amazonas region of Venezuela, a very isolated people group. They're the people group that my wife and I lived with for about a dozen years until the government of Venezuela expelled our mission back in 2006. They accused us of being operatives of the government, CIA spies. Uh, I guess I was raising up a militia in the jungle that I didn't know I was doing this, but this is what I was told I was doing by the president of the country. We were raising up armies against the government. We were stealing gold and uranium out of the jungle, working for the CIA, of course. And we had all these clandestine airstrips that you could push a button and the airstrip 
is underneath the trees and when you push a button the trees would go under the ground and the airstrip would pop up and like boy I wish we if, I, if we could do that I'd be it's like James Bond stuff or something but anyway that's what he was the president of the country began to say and we kind of knew our days were numbered when we got to that point when the president is accusing you of that but we were able to live with the Hoti long enough to see a church established there and I want to I want to weave them through our our topic uh, this afternoon is kind of what the terrain looks like for about two hours in an airplane uh, from the nearest town to where the Hoti lived. They were completely isolated from the outside world. Uh, and when I say completely, I mean completely. In fact, let me show you a picture of when they were first discovered. It's hard to see that picture. It's a little dark. There's a Hoti man right here next to a hut. I didn't take that picture. I was three years old when that picture was taken. That picture was taken by the very first missionary ever to go in to the Hoti people and make a contact with them. And what is really cool for me to be able to say right now is the guy who took that picture is in the room. Paul Dye took that picture, our speaker tonight. Uh, Paul isn't going to like this, that I say this with him in the room, but I'm going to say it anyway. He's one of my heroes uh, for a lot of reasons. Tonight we'll hear some stories that are part of the reason, but uh, the first guy into the people group that I spent 12 years of my life with was Paul Dye. He was the field leader of Venezuela, a very young field leader. and. Word reached the missionaries uh, through another people group. The Hoti live very high up, not very high up, but relatively speaking, high up in the mountains where they don't come down near the big rivers. And so they lived up in those mountains for generations and nobody in Venezuela, other than some other indigenous people groups, really one, their closest neighbor, knew they even existed. The government didn't even know they existed. And when the neighboring people group, the Piaroa, began to tell their missionaries who were living with them and learning their language that when we go up in those mountains, we run into the to the people that lived up there, which were the Hoti people. They called them the Ha Ha people. We run into the Ha Ha people up there. Paul, you haven't already told this to this group, have you? No, no not to this group. Not to this group. Okay, yeah, good. You're, you're good. Okay, good. So... The rumor, the word got out through the Piaroa that the reason they called the Hoti, the Ha Ha people, was because that's the last sound you'll hear as they drive their spear through you. They'll laugh as they kill you. Violent, very violent people. That was what the Piaroa people were telling their missionaries about the Hoti. Well, word got out to our mission leaders, Paul Dye being the, the field chairman, and they decided, which I love this, you guys, I love this. There's an unreached people group up in the mountains that nobody has ever, ever even gone in and encountered yet and contacted yet. Those, that people group just got put right to the top of the list. That's where we're going next. We're gonna go share Jesus with them. And Paul led a team up in there to the, to the ha-ha people who maybe would spear you the first time they saw you. Now, Paul, I might get some of the details of this wrong, but I was talking to Paul about a year ago. He's been training missionary pilots for us for years, and I was out there visiting our aviation department, and, and we got to talking about the Houthi contact, and he said, I need to show you my pictures. I about fell off my chair. I didn't know he, ever, I didn't know he had pictures. I had heard stories, but I didn't know he had, you have pictures of the first contact, yeah? And he graciously gave them to me, and you're seeing one of them right there. And I understood from Paul that this was the first Hoti man they encountered. It was a, a hut, they came up, they, long story, how they found them and were able to get up into their territory, and this was the first hut they came to, and don't know, are they going to come out and shoot their blowguns and throw their spears? So the guys were acting friendly and trying to make friendly laughing sounds and acting like, you know, we're nice people here. And 
this guy comes out of his hut. Now, I know the Hoti very well because I lived with him for 12 years, and honestly, it is preposterous <laughs> that anybody would ever say that a Hoti is going to throw his spear at you. They are the most nonviolent people I have ever seen or heard of. They don't even have stories of violence. Of villages attacking villages or somebody killing somebody. It doesn't even exist within their mythological stories. It's just not part of their culture. And it's not because they were godly people. They didn't know anything about God. But violence was just completely abhorrent to them. So how that rumor got started and why the P.O. were saying that is just totally made up. But the missionaries didn't know that. So they come, and this guy comes out, and of course he acts just like a Hoti would act, which is what I would expect him to, and I see it right there in the picture. He comes out of his hut, cocks his head a little bit, and stares at you. What are you up to? And that's about all the reaction you're going to get out of him. <laughs> They're just very calm, very tranquilo. Uh, I saw this picture, and I really couldn't believe it. By the way, there's, there's the young Paul right back there, who looks like his son Larry, who was a pilot for us in Venezuela. I saw this picture, and I, I couldn't believe it, because two of my closest friends are in that picture, back long before I ever knew them. This is Mateo, who I spent a month in the hospital with as an older guy. He had some very serious illnesses. This is his brother. I call him Ralph in English. It's obviously not his Hoti name. Uli Alabala is his Hoti name. That's kind of their attempt at saying Big Raphael. So I just call him Ralph, it's simpler, right? So I saw it, that's Ralph. He was my closest neighbor. You could hit his house with a, with a rock easily from my house. And Mateo, I probably spent more you know, time individually with that guy than almost anybody just because of our times out in the hospital. Here's a picture of those two guys more as I knew them. By the way, they're both in heaven with Jesus today. Uh, I can't remember the sequence of which one died first, but they both died after we left the village in 2006 through various circumstances. That's uh, Mateo has the book of Titus in his hand there. That picture was taken the very last day that we were in the village. The, the airplane that came to get us brought the book of Titus printed and bound, and we were able to hand it out to the village, and Mateo was getting his copy there. So anyway, uh, Pretty cool stories that, that we have Paul here, who was the first. Uh, he, he took the team up in there, and it was uh, some leaders from, of our organization, and they determined that the Hoti, we needed to put a team with the Hoti, and they put a team together, but it took literally decades from that time until the time the Hoti actually heard the gospel, decades. 1970 was when Paul went in there. It was 1999 when we first shared the gospel with them. There's a lot of reasons for that. They were a nomadic, hunter-gathering people group. They didn't live in villages. You could go and settle in their village and study their language. They were constantly traversing the jungle in little tiny groups. And so the missionaries might be in that. We, we built an airstrip. To, I say we. I wasn't part of that. Obviously, I was too young. But the, we, as a mission, built an airstrip and some houses there. And it was in the middle of Hoti territory, but he, the missionaries could be there literally for months and not see a soul. How are you going to learn the language? Very difficult language, by the way, extremely difficult language. Uh, how are you going to learn it when there's no people around? So it just took so long. It was extremely slow. And then missionaries would have to leave for sicknesses or whatever other reasons. And it wasn't really until the mid-1980s when some progress really began to be made. And the, and the guy in the blue shirt there, that's, that's Ralph again. That's his hut right in my backyard. Uh, my co one of my co-workers, I had a couple co-workers, we did, a couple families in there, but one of them was uh, this guy in the blue shirt, his name is Steve, I'm Steve, and he's Steve. That really threw the Hoti for a loop, they did not like that. He was there first, he had been there, he got there about four years before our family joined the, the team, and uh, when he told them that another missionary is coming, of course they wanted to know, well, what's he called, what do you call him? He said, well, his name is Steve too, they called him Teba. That's their attempt at saying Esteban, Teba. He said, well, he's, he's Teba also. 
we got to call them something different than that. You know, we got to be able to tell you. I don't know why. Uh, they, there's nobody in their world that two two people with the same name. So that just didn't compute for them. So anyway, they took to calling him Uri Teba, and I became Honey Teba. Uri is big, and Honey is little. So he's Big Steve, I'm Little Steve. So if I happen to say something about Big Steve this afternoon, you'll know who I'm talking about. I was always a little disappointed I got the honey name and he got the booty name, but I figured he earned it. He got there first. And not only did he get there first, the best language learner I will ever meet in my life, I believe, is my coworker. God poured more language learning ability out on that guy than on 50 other people combined, probably more. And I am so thankful. I have thanked the Lord so many times for putting me with him because I wouldn't have cracked that language. And I'm not uh, ashamed to admit it. It's just, no, too big, too hard. Uh, but he had cracked it. He was in there for a couple of years when my family got to the mission field and the field leader said, hey, Steve needs a coworker in there to help with the translation and the teaching. Would you be willing to go in there and partner with them? And I was thrilled. My wife and I were pretty thrilled about that. I knew Steve from my teenage years. He's a little bit older than me, but we actually knew each other uh, for a couple of years growing up. So that was exciting to me. And to, and, and to be able to get in on the ground floor, no translation had started, no Bible teaching had started, but Steve had cracked the language and I don't have to crack it myself, but I still get to be at the beginning of a work. I was so excited about that. We moved in there, and uh, that's just a little intro to the Hoti, and I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna kind of weave their story through this, uh, because I believe it really illustrates the point, the topic that I've been asked to share with you. And let me just lay a little bit of groundwork here. These are not new concepts to anybody in this room I know. Jesus told us to make disciples of all the nations and teach those disciples to observe everything that he has commanded us. The Lord wants all people to hear the good news of the gospel, but more than that, beyond that, he also wants them to be equipped to live as his followers. And that means that the job of the missionary is more than evangelism, it's more than translation. It includes church planting and discipleship. If we are going to carry out the Great Commission, it, it requires making disciples. And I believe a disciple is more than a babe in Christ crawling around on their hands and knees, totally helpless spiritually, you might say, but a babe in Christ, alive in Christ, but helpless. Helpless in the sense of being an adult son or daughter in God's family who he can work through and do his work through. You know, we would never think of such a thing in the physical realm, abandoning a little two-month-old baby, but we do it in the spiritual realm all the time. And honestly, I'll tell you, this is one of the things that has really attracted me to ABT and cemented my my admiration for ABT. They... they ABT believes this, they understand this, they're committed to this. All nations Bible translation, but that doesn't mean we're going to translate the scriptures and leave them to figure it out on their own. I'll come back to that concept, but let me just kind of quickly illustrate in a chart form uh, the difference between if a missionary's objective is evangelism versus that of church planting if your if your job is to share the gospel you, in the case of the Hoti you'd have to learn the language to even share the gospel right you couldn't do it in a second language they didn't speak a second language only their language but you, f you finally share the gospel with them and what do you end up with you end up with baby believers no organized communal fellowship worship or teaching a lack of spiritual leadership. Who's going to be the leaders here when everybody's a babe in Christ? There's no context for body function because a local church has not been established. There's not elders and pastor shepherds and deacons. and There's just, there's just a bunch of babies crawling around in uh, kind of chaotic, really, in that sense. But if the objective is church planting, if it is seeing these, seeing these unbelievers 
these people who have never heard the gospel come to understand who Jesus is and what he did for them and put their faith and trust in his finished work and become believers and babes in Christ and then grow up into young adults and then finally into mature adults in his family and all of all that is involved in the function of the local church including the structure of the local church and the leadership that God ordained for the local church that's all in place there now you have something that will last for generations way beyond one missionary or one missionary team you leave them all as babes in Christ and you get kicked out by the Venezuelan government and you come back 15, later, 15 years later, I wonder what you'll find. I think I have a pretty good idea what you'd find. And it would not be encouraging. Let me say this too. I believe this. God's word in the vernacular is the essential ingredient in carrying out the Great Commission and making disciples of the nations. How could we possibly make disciples of Christ if they don't even know what Christ said? or what God said through his word. They don't, they don't have access to that. You know, it's that, that's just kind of easy for all of us to understand. If they don't have God's word in their language, how could you ever see disciples raised up? But scripture in the vernacular without effective long-term teaching from those scriptures, and amazingly enough, this happens way more than you might imagine, way more that the scriptures are just left there. You know, they're translated, they're turned over to a bunch of unbelievers, and translators leave, and they come back years later, and they wonder why nobody's reading their scriptures. And I've often thought about that, and I've thought, well, why do we think that tribal people that live in the jungle would be any different than the people that live around us. How many unbelievers do you know are going to a bookstore and buying a Bible? I just want to read that Bible. We have 400 versions of that in our language, and I want to read one. You ever met a person like that? No. And yet we think if we go translate for a people group, oh, of course they're going to want to read it. No, they're probably not. Unless something, unless God's Spirit does something to, to draw that person through, through some kind of understanding of what that book represents and what's in it and draws them to it, they're not going to want to read it. And then how many people do we know who pick up a Bible, start reading it, and just come to a clear understanding of the Gospel? I'm not saying that's impossible, because I certainly don't want to limit God's Spirit, but I, I don't see that happening very often. That's why he gave the gift of teaching to the church, right? So that an, an evangelist to, to evangelize the unsafe so, so that we can explain and expound and help them understand and God's Spirit is drawing them. Apart from that, I'll just be honest, I just think we're kidding ourselves if we think it's going to work. So that kind of an approach often results in Bibles that remain unread a syncretized understanding of the gospel, what little bit they do understand if they're reading it without anybody to help explain it to them, they just suck it right into their worldview and mix it all together and fit it in the slots that they know it must fit into because how, you know, they got to fit it into something and it becomes a very confused, syncretized, uh, distorted gospel message that wouldn't save anybody. And it often results in people groups that remain largely unreached. And please don't hear me to be critical. I'm not trying to be critical of anybody or anybody's. I'm just saying I believe that the scriptures need to be taught. And newborn babes in Christ need to be discipled. And churches need to be established. Otherwise, the rest of it is pretty much wasted effort, I think. Let me see if I can illustrate it this way. And then I want to kind of jump into uh, some examples of this. I believe the message must make it intact through the worldview grid of the target people. Our title for this session is uh, The Gospel and Their Worldview Grid. Most of us are very aware of the barrier of language when it comes to sharing the gospel with an unreached people group. All those groups that we were seeing laid out for us there in Colombia, if, if we were to go in and visit them and 
try to carry on a conversation, it takes you about two and a half seconds to realize I can't say anything that they understand. And I don't understand anything that they're saying. How will I share Jesus with these people? This is a huge barrier. It's going to take me years to learn this language. That one, we all kind of stare us in the face. We get it. The one I think we're relatively ignorant of, and I put myself in that category because before I went and lived with a Hoti, I, would, I totally would have underestimated the barrier that culture or worldview is to a people's understanding. You and I all have a worldview grid. Every human being on earth does. It's influenced by many things. Now, fortunately for everybody in this room, our worldview grid has been heavily influenced by God's word, right? So the more we understand and believe God's word, the more our worldview grid lines up with God's worldview grid. And the less we know about God or have heard his word taught, the further our worldview grid would be away from God's worldview grid. But everybody has one. The Hoti had one. In my little picture here on the screen, the butterfly in the picture, if we could let that represent the gospel message. Beautiful, beautiful message. It's complete, it's intricate, it's well thought out, it's designed, it's beautiful. The Hoti, in the case, in the case of the people I worked with, they needed to understand properly that butterfly. They needed to know where the pieces all fit, in the proper place so that when they finally hear the whole message it's it's it still looks like the butterfly it is the true gospel it's an understanding of the true message but between the hoti and the communicator of the gospel is this worldview grid it's the thing with which they think and understand it's the thing with which i think and understand everything i hear that somebody tells me i filter it through my worldview grid what I know to be true and right about everything, well, so do the Hoti. So as I'm teaching through the gospel and I'm teaching this component, whatever that is, the Hoti, he is hearing it through that grid. And he says, oh, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about this right here. And he takes that piece and he sticks it right there. And then the next day, we're talking about this component. Oh, I know what he's talking about today. He's talking about this right here. He sticks it into a slot in his worldview grid where he knows it must fit because clearly you and I have the same worldview grid. He doesn't know what a worldview grid is, but he believes we all think alike, just like we tend to think. Everybody thinks alike. We're human, human but we don't think alike. So think about what happens if the missionary is not aware has not taken the time to study and discover what is the worldview grid of the Hoti. What is he going to think we're saying when God says this right here? If the missionary doesn't know that, through the study of the worldview of that people group, there will be massive misunderstanding and, communication, and, and miscommunication. And when the missionary is finished telling this whole story and teaching this truth, and you look at the butterfly, if the Hoti could draw it out, you'd say, what is that? That doesn't even look like a creature. It doesn't even stick together. It's just all pieces all over the place. Imagine if that was the gospel understanding. And that also is very common. That happens all the time. So how do we navigate through this? How do we like see the gospel make it through their worldview grid? And I just wanted to mention three things. I believe language proficiency is obviously very critical. If you can't communicate the message accurately in the language they understand, then we're not gonna have much chance. Understanding their worldview as we just talked about we need to know. I'm going to give you some examples of this as I walk through this. It's, I think you're going to say, wow, I see what you're saying. If the missionaries didn't know that the Hoti were going to think that, think of the implications of the gospel there. That's going to be pretty obvious to you, I think. And then finally, I believe teaching God's word in the heart language, the language that they understand. They're not trying to, oh, what's that mean? What's that word mean? What's that word mean? And 
chronologically and contrastively. And all I mean by that is if we start at the beginning and we lay God's word out the way God laid it out and we build those foundations for proper understanding of the gospel, that gives them a much better chance of understanding what actually happened on the cross as opposed to just going right to the story of Jesus coming to earth and dying on the cross and they don't know who God is and they don't know how you know how you say we're sinners what, what's that you say God's angry at it what's why I'm a good person all the Hoti were good people believe me what, what, what is the shedding of blood what death what for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever gave him, who did he give him to? What are you talking about? Okay, but so we lay those foundations starting at the beginning and, and I say contrastively and what I mean by that is the Hoti, as he hears the truth unfold, he, like me and like you, is not a good, what would I say, analyzer of his own worldview. He is not able to naturally to hear something that God said and say to himself hmm that is different from what I believe no he's gonna take it and he's gonna say oh it's it's what I believe and it fits right in this slot right here whereas if the missionary is able to say wait a minute now I think I know what you're probably thinking God just said there because the missionary has carefully studied that worldview grid and can predict how they're going to understand what they're hearing and says, wait a minute, you guys, you, you think God's saying this, right? And they say, yeah. No, he's not saying that. He's actually saying this. That's what I mean. Contrasting God's worldview to their worldview so that the Hoti has to hear that and say, oh, wait a minute. You're right. God says this and we say this. Which one am I going to believe? Now you've gotten somewhere. When the person has to choose, do I believe God or do I believe me? Do I believe my father? And if the people choose, like in the case of the Hoti, if they choose, you know what? I'm going to believe what God said. Now you have faith combined with understanding. And now you have something. But the only way you get to faith combined with understanding, if you're trying to reach an unreached people group, is through language proficiency, worldview understanding, and very careful, thorough teaching. And if a missionary is willing to do all that and spend the years to do that, it's amazing what can happen. And I want to kind of jump right into the Hoti context and see if I can give you some examples of some of these principles lived out in a real people group who, by the way, right as we're speaking, are doing some amazing spiritual work for God that I hope I get time at the end to share with you things I've just heard about in the last week actually that are just thrilling to my heart but this is this is a picture of the Hoti church this is after we were kicked out I didn't take that picture that building didn't even exist when we were there uh, gave a digital camera to some Hoti friends when I was meeting up with them in a city in Venezuela after we were kicked out and I said take this camera in there and take some pictures I want to see what everybody looks like you know don't let them don't let the soldiers see it they'll take it from you but I taught them how to be like super spies and hide their camera and take pictures without anybody seeing they thought they had a lot of fun with that figuring out ways they could snap pictures under their arm or behind their back so that nobody sees what they're doing anyway this is one of the pictures that came from that and this is the Hoti church being taught by the Hoti believers let me maybe start right here uh, with this guy Nanao to give you a little idea of <coughs> As the missionaries were learning the Hoti language and, and building towards that time when they could finally teach, it was becoming evident to us that the Hoti were, they were inclined to believe what, what the Bible was going to say. And they were, they were giving little clues to that. And one day, it was more than a clue, we were talking to this guy, Big Steve, and his house, we were talking to Naneo. And, we were, we were trying to engage him in a conversation about his worldview. And our theory was this. Let's get him talking about some of the spirits that they believe in and see if we can poke some holes 
in their worldview grid. Not, not offend them, but just get them thinking to where he's going, oh, wait a minute, yeah, that doesn't really make sense. I, I see what you're saying. We say this and we say this, they can't both be true. We thought if, if they begin to question their worldview a little bit, and then we share God's truth with them, maybe they're gonna be more inclined to say, hey, that makes sense. We didn't realize they were already way beyond that point. We were talking with Nane and we were trying to engage him in that conversation. He was not engaging, which is pretty unusual for the Hoti. They're very helpful, answer any question you have. But he was just not engaging and he looked a little perturbed and like he didn't want to have that conversation. And I remember Steve finally saying to him, Nane, is everything okay? Are, am I offending you somehow? And Naneo said to him, I don't want to talk about the spirits that live underneath the mountain anymore. That's the realm we were trying to get him to talk about. I don't want to talk about those spirits anymore. And he pointed at the Bible on Steve's desk. He said, I want to know what that book right there says, because that's what I believe. Wow. I'm like, wow. Now, okay, there's a lot of history that kind of, what, 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 what would drive him to say that? Well, the Hoti were pretty simple people in this, I don't mean simple-minded people, but they were simple in their, in their view of others. They were trusting people. They naturally trusted us. Now, not all people groups are that way. Some people groups, they're very much the opposite. They don't trust anybody from the outside. The Hoti trusted people, maybe too much. And their view was, hey, you guys have come in here, learned our language, you're our friends, and you came to tell us what that book says, and you say the Creator wrote that book. Well, the Creator obviously knows what he's talking about, so I would say he's probably going to be telling the truth, and you guys wouldn't lie about what he says in that book, because you're our friend. So just tell us what it says, we believe it. That was their attitude. And when Naneo started talking like that, that's when it really became clear to us that, wow, they really, he was sort of speaking the mind of the whole valley there. That's where they were at. So we began to teach. They built a house for us to teach under. That's the biggest roof in the history of the Hoti people group by a factor of at least 10. They just built little tiny houses and they wanted to build one big roof, big enough, they said, for everybody in the valley to fit under it. So when it starts raining, you guys can just keep talking. And that's something. They said, we need three months warning before you start teaching the Bible because we want to build that roof. That's how long it took them. So we did. So we began. In the beginning, God. By, the, by this time, by the way, they were all literate. They were an illiterate culture. They didn't know what reading and writing even was. They had never seen a word written on a piece of paper. But we, after we learned the language, developed an alphabet, taught them how to read, they're all readers now. So they understand the concept of just maybe for less than a year they had been literate. And now this is God's book in their language. They're going to read what God is saying. Uh, to, to say that they were highly motivated, I don't think I could overstate how highly motivated they were to hear. Everybody in the valley, with the exception of one lady, came to every teaching session we did. There was about 150 people in the valley at that time. Uh, Big Fire's wife never came to any of the sessions. Don't really know exactly why. She never did. But everybody else did. And we've taught every day, a couple hours every morning. They wanted us to teach seven days a week. We had to negotiate down to five. Can we have two days to get ready for the next five? Oh, I suppose you can. You know, how would you like that if you're a pastor and they're saying, no, every day, seven to nine, every day. That's what we want. So in the beginning, God, and we began to talk about who God is. They didn't know who he was. And they immediately fell in love with him. Uh, he's amazing. He created everything by speaking it into being. And of course, we walked through the creative account there, and they, they just saw the power of God. He could just command it to become, and it would become. And he's good, and he's only good, and he never does evil. He never does anything that would be wrong. He is only good, and he's loving. And he, we just kind of... A thumbnail sketch of God and then we're gonna let God demonstrate who he is through the account of the scriptures and when we came to the Garden of Eden here's where some of this worldview stuff comes into play you're very familiar with the account in the Garden of Eden and how how Adam and Eve fell into sin God said the day if you eat of this tree you will live forever the day you eat of this tree you will surely die 
his enemy comes along and he said, what did God say? God said that if we eat it or touch it, we'll die, Eve said. No, you won't die. You won't die. God knows that if you eat that fruit, you'll be like him. You'll know good and evil. Okay, there's something in the Hoti worldview grid that if the missionary is not familiar with, right here, you're going to lose them. It's going to end right here. It's going to turn uh, 180 degrees in the wrong direction, right here. Because there is this default setting in the Hoti worldview, and it's, I don't know how to explain it. It makes no sense, but it's true. The person who comes along behind somebody else and gives clarifying information, new information, that's always the one you believe. Always. So in a practical setting, if I were to say to you, you know, supper's at, supper's at 5.15, and I went to use the restroom, and Bryant got up and said, what did he say? He said, it's 5.15. No, it's 5. He probably just wants to talk longer, which would be true, but <laughs> you all would say, oh, that Steve is such a liar. And then if I walked in the room, I wouldn't even know it, but everybody's looking at me like, we know what you are, buddy. We don't trust you. Whether I'm telling the truth or he's telling the truth, you will all, if you're Hoti, believe the second guy. It is just uncanny. It's the default position. It's like somebody set a switch. It's all through their stories. It's in their everyday life. So what happens in the garden? Think about this. If we would have just taught through the account of the scriptures, just as it's laid out, every Hoti would have heard, oh, here all this time we've been thinking God's good and he never tells a lie, but now we're finding out the truth. And by the way, I like this Satan guy. I like how he thinks, because he thinks just like a Hoti. I'm the captain of my ship. Nobody tells me what to do. That's kind of the Hoti way. Imagine not understanding that. You see the ramifications of it? So here's, here's the Hoti worldview grid. The one who comes along behind with new information is always to be believed. So how do we get that piece of the butterfly through the grid? Well, my coworker Steve, I don't take any credit for any of this that we talk about here. My coworker Steve was gifted in these areas and he just always seemed to know how to prepare the Hoti to get him through that grid. And I remember him telling me, he said, I don't think this is that hard. These people are incredibly intelligent. All we have to do is establish very clearly in their minds who Satan is and that they can't trust him. And when he comes on the scene, they won't trust him. They're not so incapable of thinking that they're just going to, you know, if you haven't prepared them, they're going to fall in that ditch. But if you prepare them, they won't. So we decided, okay, we're going to prepare them so that when Satan shows up on the scene, they're going to go, there's that liar. That's what we wanted them to say. There's that liar. Can't trust him. So we started to tell them about angels and how God created the angelic realm and what they were for. They were servants. They were messengers. They were created by God to do his will. And when he told one of them to go over there and do that and then come back and report to him, that angel was supposed to go over there and do that and come back and report to him. Doesn't sound real hard to understand, does it? But uh, we got to the end of that session when we were teaching that simple truth and we said so you guys if God tells that angel Lucifer to go do something what is that angel Lucifer supposed to do and their response was well I have no idea what maybe should he do that's what that means I don't know that's literally what they were saying I don't know and then, you know, one of the younger guys might turn to Ralph, the older guy, and say, Ralph, what do you think the angel's supposed to do? And Ralph says, I don't know what to say. I don't know what I would say to answer that. I don't know what he's supposed to do. And you're the missionary hearing that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. This is a really simple concept, but they're tripping on it. Okay, here we are at that worldview grid again. My coworker Steve, before we got to this point, he knew they were going to trip on it. It was so easy to predict that they were going to trip on this because 
one of the pillars of the worldview grid of the Hoti, one of the things that they attach everything to is their view of authority. They despise it. They hate it. They hate it for different reasons than my culture here in North America hates it. We kind of hate it because sort of like, well, nobody tells me what to do. I'll decide what to do, sort of, as the North American culture, captain of my ship. The Hoti kind of hated it in a similar way. That was true of them, but it was more of a disgust, an abhorrence of the idea of somebody telling somebody else what to do. How arrogant would that be? Ooh, I would never tell somebody what to do. You'll never hear a Hoti get up in the morning and say, listen, everybody, I'm going up river fishing. Nobody go up river fishing today because that's where I'm going. If a Hoti said that, guess where everybody's going fishing today? <laughs> they'll turn their head, they'll snort a little air through their nose, and they'll go, and they'll go right up river. Because that's just the Hoti way. So God tells the angel what he's supposed to do. That is cutting against the grain of something they deeply hold as a value, that authority is despicable. And they love God. They think he's awesome. And now they're hearing for the first time that he actually created beings so he could tell them what to do. Yuck. That is so yuck in their worldview, if that's a word. It just offends them. Well, I don't know what he should do. I don't know what he should do. They can't even bring themselves to state it. This was another one of those easy ways through, according to Steve. He said, we just need to, we just need to make sure they clearly under, understand who God is and that he has the right to do this. Well, this one didn't work quite so well because they, they did believe that, but they were still tripping over this. And I remember we taught for four days in a row on that one truth, that God created them and they're supposed to do what he says, and we got the same confused response every day. And on the fifth day, I think it was a Friday morning, as we were preparing to teach, I, I remember Steve saying, all right, I think we need to like change our tactics here. It's not working. All of our illustrations are not working. We were trying all kinds of illustrations just to get them to say, oh yeah, they should obey God. They wouldn't say it. And Steve said to me that morning, he said, I'm just going to get really direct with them today. I'm going to be really blunt, and I'm going to tell them exactly what's going on in their minds, and I'm going to see how they react. And I heard that, and I got all excited, like, this is going to be fun. It's going to, going to watch and see how they respond to this. And he got up front, and he said, this is the first time we tried this. He said, can I be blunt today? Can I speak raw? That's how you say, can I speak raw and I was watching the Hoti crowd, you know, and I noticed everybody sort of sat up on their bench. Got this curious look in their eyes like, oh, this might be good. What's he going to say? <laughs> Remember, these are people who have already decided, I believe what God says. I believe him. But they're tripping over a stumbling block that they don't even know how to identify. They cannot identify that stumbling block that they're tripping on. The missionary who studied their worldview grid from an outsider's perspective, they see exactly what they're stumbling on. And Steve's about to tell them exactly what they're stumbling on. He said, we've been telling you for four days that God created the angels and they are his servants and they are to do what he says. And when we ask you what they're supposed to do, you say, I don't know. And you guys want to know what the truth is? And they said, yeah, what's the truth? You guys understand perfectly well what God is saying. You're not confused at all, he said. They said, we're not. Remember that? We're not? No. The truth is you understand it perfectly well, but you hate it. You hate what you're hearing. You hate the thought that God would tell some creature, an angel, what to do, and that angel is supposed to obey. You hate that concept. And so you're acting confused, but you're really not. And then he stopped talking. And he waited about 30 seconds. And uh, Timoteo stood up. Do I have Timoteo in this picture? That's his wife right there, and he's right there. One of the most influential men, probably the most influential man in the whole valley. He stood up, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, uh, everybody listen to what I have to say. He's right. That is what we're doing. 
we understand what God is saying, but we don't like it, so we act confused. And then he said, we will not do that anymore. From now on, whatever God says, we believe it, whether we like it or not, he said. Now we're like high-fiving each other behind the <laughs> Did you hear that? Hair standing up on the back of your neck. Well, what Timoteo doesn't know is that what he's about to hear is going to be even harder. Is it, you think the stumbling block that they just got over was big? The next one is even bigger. So we get through, the, we get through that stumbling block. And then we said to them, so would you like to know what this Lucifer angel did? Remember, we're trying to prepare them for the garden account so that they don't trust God's enemy. You guys want to know what Lucifer did? Yeah, of course, this is the best entertainment they've ever had because they've never been entertained, right? So this is all, all these stories are so fascinating to them. Yeah, what did he do? They're expecting to hear, well, he, he did what God said. That was what they expected to hear. And then we told them about Lucifer's rebellion and how... He was lifted up with pride in his own heart, and he said, I will be like the Most High. I will lift my stars above the stars of God. He's not going to submit to God anymore. He's not going to listen to God. They were just shocked, shocked by that. What? They thought that was foolishness. Like, why would he think he, God created him? How does he think he's going to do that? Well, that, you know, hey, <laughs> good question, but that's what he said. And I remember we asked them, what do you guys think God's going to do about this if Lucifer rebels against him? Now, if you were the missionary studying the Hoti worldview grid, you would be able to predict their answer. And to just kind of sum it up really quickly, I don't want to get into too much, take too much time on this, but here's what the Hoti worldview grid says. Anger is evil. To ever show anger is to prove oneself to be evil. So I've seen my friend Mateo, who I showed you his picture earlier, I, I saw uh, another Hoti man steal his wife away from him. The second wife that that guy stole away from him in his life. Mateo didn't react at all, didn't show any anger, didn't even show any annoyance, just acted like it wasn't even happening, just carried on with his whole life. Because... If he were to get angry, if Mateo were to get angry at this guy stealing his wife, he's proving to everybody how evil he is. Far more evil than that guy stealing my wife is if I react in anger because I am now at the core an evil person. So what do you think they're going to think when God gets angry at Lucifer's rebellion? Their natural default position would be, well, we thought he was good. He is not good. Passageway through the grid, another simple concept, but properly established that God is good and that he only does good. So if he gets angry, it must be good. We didn't say those words to them, but they had, they had learned enough about God that they were convinced that he's good and he only does good. He could never do evil. So when he got angry, it was a shock. And I remember Steve saying to them after that information came out, he said, did you guys hear that? God got angry and he really got angry and he's even going to punish Lucifer. He isn't going to ignore him and go over here and make a new one. This is what the Hoti thought God would do. Just ignore him, go make a new Lucifer and see if this one will do what he says. And then make another one and see if that one will do what he says. Eventually he'll find one who will do what he says because that's what they thought would be good. God got angry. And I remember Steve saying to them, wow, here, here we thought God was good and now we're finding out he got angry. I, I guess he's not good after all. Of course, we're not going to let them think we believe that very long, but we wanted to see, are they going to amen us? And it was amazing. He said that, and the same guy, Timoteo, spoke up, and he said, wait, wait a minute. No, he said, God's good, and we know God is good, so if God got angry, then it must be good for him to get angry. And I cannot exaggerate or overstate how big a hurdle that is in the Hoti worldview grid. That's the biggest one. Their view of anger is even more deeply held than that authority thing. And I don't even know how to, you know, help us, like, an example from my own culture to relate to that. So I can't even really think of a good one. 
but it's just such a profound clash. And they said, no. so you see what was happening here? This is exactly what we're talking about, trying to talk about in this. The Hoti worldview says to ever show anger or be angry at something is evil. God says, I as the creator am angry at sin. I don't like it and I will punish it. And I am right to be angry about it. Here's God's worldview, here's the Hoti worldview, and they're going like this. And the missionary who's understood the worldview grid says, you see, you're trying to put this piece of the butterfly over here. You don't have to say it to, that, them, to them that way, right? You just say, I know what you guys are thinking, right? You're thinking this. And they say, no, wait a minute. No, we've already decided God is good. And that piece of the butterfly comes right through the grid, and it's in the right spot when it comes through on the other side. And if, if that continues to happen and the gospel is laid out and they get to the end and that butterfly is what it's supposed to be. And now those same people who have already demonstrated numerous times that whatever God says we're going to believe, how hard do you think it's going to be for them to believe that Jesus paid their sin debt? That's the good news. That's the good stuff. They're getting over the bad stuff at the beginning, the hurdles. And we felt like at this point, to tell you the truth, we were like, wow. If we can lay this truth out in a way that they understand, if we don't mess it up linguistically or through poor understanding of their worldview grid, we think everybody's going to believe because they're just demonstrating their willingness to believe. And so we kind of did. We launched through that. And we talked through the fall of Adam and Eve, and we shared the promise that God made uh, right there in Genesis 3 of a, of a coming deliverer. And of course, the Hoti, this was totally, you know, not understandable to them. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. If you don't have a New Testament understanding of the scriptures, that isn't going to mean anything to you. But we just told the Hoti at this point, listen, here's what God is saying. This is all you really need to know right now. God is promising that the seed of the woman is going to crush, bruise the head of the serpent, God's enemy. The enemy is going to strike his heel like a snake strikes your heel. But he, the deliverer, the descendant of the woman, the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And if he does that, we said to them, if he does that, if God keeps this promise, we're going to be okay. And again, it's hard for me to, you know, communicate to you how distraught the Hoti were when Adam rebelled and Eve. They, they, they were so in love with Adam because their biggest question in the, that they wanted answered out of this book is, who are we? Who are the Hoti? We know we're good. We can't wait to hear that book say that we're good. That was their attitude. And then Adam and Eve are made in God's image and they walk with God and, they're, and they're, there's no sin separate. They're perfect. And he's our father and, our, and she's our mother. You could see their collective chest just getting puffier and puffier with pride. They were so... And then they do the one thing God said not to. And it results in the death of Adam and Eve. We talked through spiritual death and what all that meant and... I remember one guy coming up afterwards. I think I have his picture in here. I might get to it. In fact, let me see. Maybe I'll get to that. If I don't, I'll try to remember to tell you that anyway. But at this point, we introduced this term to them. Tatana uh, Buleke Mango. It literally means the one who will defeat Satan. That's who we need to be looking for. That seed of the woman who's going to defeat Satan. In fact, here's the picture I was thinking about. This guy's name is Ite. Bird is his name. The Hoti don't show much emotion. In fact, really hardly any at all. There's cultural reasons for that. But I remember after the fall, after we taught the fall, Ite came right down the middle row. And he came up front and he was talking to us. And he had this fear and anger on his face. His jaw was literally shaking with it. And I'll never forget what he said to us. He said, why did he do that to us? Talking about Adam. Why would he do that? To, I can't believe he did that to us. And I remember saying to him, so, so if, if Adam rebelled and Adam is dead, spiritually dead, he's separated from God and we descended from Adam, I wonder what that means about us. Bird did not want to go there. 
He knew exactly what it meant, but he didn't want to verbalize it. It was too terrifying. Remember, though, God made a promise. So that was pretty reassuring to them that God made this promise. Now, think about this. Here's 150 people who don't even know whether we, the communicators, know if God kept that promise or not. Are we still waiting for that promise? They didn't know. We're going to kind of follow this through. So Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, and the Hoti realized they're not living in the Garden of Eden, and we went through some of these Old Testament stories, and we got to lay some really important foundations. You know, Cain, or Cain came the way of Cain, and Abel came by faith. Abel believed God, and God accepted his offering. Cain came the way of Cain, God didn't accept his offering. We can't come to God our way, we told him. Don't even try to figure out your own way to come back to God. It isn't going to work. Look, Cain tried it. It didn't work. You have to come by faith, and that is believing what God says. And the Hoti were, okay, we won't try. We'll do it his way. And, of course, you have the, the shedding of the blood of the lamb as a covering for the sin of the sinner. And we get to start laying that foundation. We introduce this term, Hodemunga Mieli Danko. It means the one who will die on behalf of people. So we started calling the Savior this starting to build in their mind of who, who, what he's going to defeat Satan. He's going to die on our behalf somehow. They don't understand the cross yet. We went through Abraham, the life of Abraham. God narrowing it down that would be a descendant of Abraham and through the offering of Isaac and God providing the ram in place of Isaac. So much I'm not going to take the time to tell you here about all this, but we went really slow through this. It took months to teach through all this stuff. The Hoti were very particular, too. They did not want you skipping parts of the story. You can't jump from one generation and go three generations down. They didn't like that. They wanted to know who that guy came from, and then who did he come from, and who did he come They want that whole thing tied together. That was really important to them. I remember one thing that stood out to me at this point in the story when, when we were going through the offering of Isaac. And I remember Steve said to the crowd, he said, let me ask you guys a question. What would happen, what will happen if, if Abraham slays his son Isaac and Isaac is just dead? That's the end of Isaac. Because the Hoti had concluded when God told Abraham to offer his son, they concluded that Abraham would offer his son to God, but God would raise him back to life. Because they, they reasoned it this way. Abraham is a God believer. That's why God called him righteous. So he's going to do what God said. But God said the Savior will come through Isaac, uh, through the line of Isaac, so God maybe is going to bring him back to life. That's what they thought. And then they heard, it, as we read through the text, that that's what Abraham was thinking. And they said, oh, well, there you have it. It's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> but then Steve got to this point and he said, but what if that doesn't happen? What if Isaac is dead and he just stays dead? And this guy, his name is Big Fire. I, I mentioned him a few minutes ago. His wife is the one who never came. Big Fire, by the way, is the life of the party. He's the only outgoing Hoti that I've ever met. The only one you would say, oh, he's outgoing. You know, all the Hoti are pretty stoic, reserved, big fires like. In our culture, he would just kind of blend in, but in the Hoti culture, he stands out as the center of all the attention. I love the guy. He's in heaven too now. Anyway, Steve said, what happens if Isaac is just dead? And I remember big fire. He didn't, it didn't take him two seconds, and he blurted out loud, really loud. He said, Nung Huayaga, and he threw his armor out. Nung Huayaga, and that means forever separated. Forever separated. And he was saying, if Isaac is dead and he stays dead, I am forever separated from God. I have no chance because a Savior is supposed to come through Isaac. If there's no Isaac, there's no Savior. If there's no Savior, I'm Nung Huayaga. That's how clear it was. And then when, so we got back into the story and God says, Abraham, Abraham, stop. You heard this collective sigh of relief, kind of. The Hoti were like, oh, that's even better. We thought God was going to raise him back to life, but he didn't even die. That's great. And then we got to talk again about the sacrifice of the ram and start laying those foundations. Of course, we went through a lot of history, the Passover. I'm keeping an eye on that clock, so I want to keep moving here. And again, just I don't have to go through these stories. You guys are all so familiar with them. 
But think of the truth that's being established by God hundreds and hundreds of years before the cross in the history of the nation of Israel. And of course, we got to the law. We knew this was the one big hurdle remaining. Honestly, after they got through the authority and the anger and all that, we didn't really see too many hurdles coming where they were going to really, in their minds, trip over them except the giving of the law. Because like I said, they were very self-righteous. Now, you, if you lived with them, it wouldn't be like they act that way. That you would say, oh, those are so, they're so self-righteous. They didn't act that way. But when you got into their head, oh, it was just so clear. They knew they were good. Why did they know they were good? Because I'm not an angry person. I don't get angry. And that is by definition then a good person, right? So we get to the law. Thou shalt not murder, God said. By the way, think of the imagery. I know you guys know all this, but of all that was going on on Mount Sinai and the sh ground shaking and the fire burning and the perimeter, you can't step across the perimeter. If everybody steps across the perimeter, stone them to death. Don't even touch the body. If an animal steps across the perimeter, stone it. Don't touch the body or you'll be defiled. You cannot approach me. I am holy. You are not. It was just such stark imagery. And that, that was not lost on the Houthi. Thou shalt not murder. Oh, yeah, I would never murder. I would never do that. That was a good one. They liked that. You know, God says later on that if you've ever been angry in your heart at another person, you've committed murder already in your heart. They said, really? He said that? Yeah. Because even though they would never admit openly that they get angry, they know in their heart they do. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Could have stopped right there. They're all guilty. Adultery is wrong in their worldview. Even before the Bible got there, it was wrong. You should not do that. But there were things built into their culture that I don't want to take the time right now to even talk about that made it just nearly inevitable. Just almost 100% inevitable that it was going to happen. So they're all guilty of that. And then, you know, God says later on, too, that if you've ever looked at with lust after someone else's wife, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You know what their response to that was? It was so priceless. They said, we are doubly doomed. <laughs> we're doomed because of Adam's sin. We realize he took us all down. And up till that point, they were blaming everything on Adam. All their trouble was Adam's fault. Now they said, we realize we do all those things that God said not to. We're in trouble. Again, we're like high-fiving each other by... <laughs> The law did exactly what it was supposed to do. We got to the birth of Christ, and they were so excited to hear that because they had come to the conclusion that this Satan defeater that we've been waiting for has to be God. Who else could it be? And when we, when we got to this point where the angel is announcing the birth of Christ, that he will be called the Son of the Most High, God with us. They said, that's the one we've been waiting for, and we knew it, they said. We said, you're right, that's the one we've been waiting for, but what do you mean you knew it? Well, they said, clear back there at Isaac, we figured out it had to be God. Because what had happened was, Isaac was such a miracle child, you all know that story so well, that they concluded this has to be the Savior, this is a miracle. Those people are almost 100 years old and they had a baby? He's a miracle, this has got to be the one. And when we found out that's what we were thinking, we had to sort of burst their bubble. And we asked them, you know, who did Isaac descend from? And we took it all the way back to Adam. Is Adam separated from God? Is he a sinner cut off from God? Yeah. Is Abraham a sinner separated from Yeah. Well, then Isaac would be too. Yeah. Well, how could a sinner who's separated from God pay for your sin? He can't even pay for his own. How's he going to pay for yours? Oh, they were so disappointed to hear that. <laughs> oh, it made such sense. And they talked amongst themselves, and they concluded the Savior must be God. Because that's the only person in the story that they knew who was alive, who could give their life for them. Couldn't be an angel. That doesn't make sense. Can't be a descendant of Adam. Now we understand that because they're already all dead. It's got to be God. And now we have a God-man. God in human form. A babe come into the... This is the one. Okay, so to say they fell in love with him would be... Totally an understatement. They loved him so much. They totally taken by his miracles. 
But they had this unique perspective, and I could sum it up this way. It was sort of like this. As we're going through the life of Christ, they were loving every part of the story, but they were thinking in their mind, hurry up and get to the part where he's dead. We just hurry up and get to the part where he's dead? Okay, and you kind of can, based on all their Old Testament understanding of the sacrifice that has to be made, they just want to hear that he went ahead and made the sacrifice necessary to pay for their sin. We love him, but hurry up and get to that part. And, and it came out really clearly at this point of the story where Jesus, Barabbas, which do you want, Jesus or Barabbas? And the crowd is saying, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And in the back row sat Mareko, way in the back. Young guy, he's in heaven too, by the way, died after we left. He was probably 20 years old at the time. He's sitting in the farthest back bench and he's saying out loud, loud enough you can hear it all through the, the building. He's saying, I agree. I say crucify him too. I say you got to crucify him. That's just what you got to do. You got to crucify him. <laughs> and we were not liking what we were hearing, to say the least. We're like, what is Monaco thinking? Never would have thought such a thing. We went and sat down next to him during a little break and we said, so Mariko, why would you say that? Why would you be agreeing with the, with the crowd? Crucify him. And he looked at us like, that is such a stupid question. That was the look on his face. And again, I'll never forget what he said. He said, if they don't kill him, I have to die. And I went, oh. I think you understand this a little better than I do. <laughs> I've never thought of it that way. Now, mind you, I wouldn't be yelling that if I, knowing what I know, I wouldn't be in the crowd yelling that. Because I know who he is and I love him, but I know what I'd be thinking in my heart. Please, you must, or I have no hope. And that's where Mareko was. Now, Mareko doesn't know what's coming. You know, he went through the crucifixion. That was totally overwhelming to them. We didn't show any pictures didn't show any films or video clips. Uh, they wouldn't have even been able to process that, I don't think. We were just reading the account. And Mareko, the same guy, he's got his hand over his face back in the back. He's saying, I don't want to hear that. Oh, why why'd they have to do that to him? I don't want to hear about that with every step of the... It was just overwhelming. In fact, I had never seen a Houthi adult shed a tear, ever. And we had been there six years or seven years by now. It's, again, a cultural thing. You just don't show emotion. There's very good reasons culturally for that. But they were having the hardest time. I could see all the Houthi guys trying to keep those tears in those eyes. You know how guys do when they're trying to keep the tears in their eyes and they're blinking and turning their head. They don't want to see They don't want one to come down the cheek. That's what they were doing in there. Cause, you know, some of them were just not even trying. You know, it was just too overwhelming. So we went through the crucifixion. We talked, of course, all about what what that accomplished the different things that happened on the cross you know the sky going dark and jesus looking to the father and saying, my god my god why have you forsaken me and we talked about what was going on there as the father was separating himself from his son that spiritual separation that spiritual death the penalty for sin that jesus was undergoing for us at first the hoti were very scared when they heard jesus say that they thought maybe God was looking down on this sacrifice that Jesus is making and saying, ah, that's not good enough for me. I don't think I accept that. And that's why Jesus says, why have you forsaken me? And then we, we pointed out how, you remember how when Adam sinned, he was separated from God. That's what spiritual death is. It's separation from God. Jesus is taking that punishment for us. He's not gonna, God's not gonna separate himself from his son forever. Jesus, remember, said he's gonna rise in three days. Watch, see what happens. Three days later, he comes out of the grave alive. The father saying, I accept the sacrifice. Sin has been dealt with, paid for, it's complete, it's done. Now come back out of the grave. And the Hoti, it was funny how they, they were so convinced that Jesus is who he says he is, that it wasn't like when, when he came out of the grave, they're like, oh, good. It was like, well, yeah, he said he was going to. Of course he's going to never entered their mind for a second that it wouldn't happen. So when it did, it was no big surprise. But we got to point out the significance of that. Look, he has defeated sin. He has defeated the enemy. He has bruised the head of the enemy, just like God promised back there in Genesis chapter 3. He's defeated him by giving his life as a payment for sin, by shedding his blood as a payment for sin. 
now what? You know, we went through that. Of course, I'm going so fast through that stuff, but now you have a whole group of people who have heard and understood. And the butterfly, there it is. And they see it, and it's the butterfly. And then we said to them, so now what? You've heard the story, now what? And they didn't know. They had no idea what to say. Oh, I don't know, what, what are we supposed to do? Imagine in that moment being able to read John 3.16 for the first time in the history of that language. First time they've ever heard those words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. What's the one thing all through those Old Testament stories that pleased God every time it was done? Oh, faith, they said. Whenever a person believed God and had faith, he was pleased with that. That's what he's saying now. If you'll take him at his word, if you'll believe him, if you'll trust what he said about what his son accomplished, he will put your sin on him. Your sin is dealt with and he'll give you his righteousness. You'll be sealed up inside of him and you'll be alive forever. Just believe him. And we decided at that point, we're not going to ask, so how many of you believe? Would have been great. Would have made a great picture. You know. But we thought, no, let's... Don't pollute it in any way. Just let them think about it. And, and we went around the village for several days after that. We talked to everybody. And we asked them personally, you know, in private, in their hut. So what do you think about what you heard? And I'll just share two responses that I remember. One guy said to us, he said, I, I think Jesus is just like Noah's Ark. I'm getting in the boat. <laughs> we didn't talk about that here, but, you know... That's a picture of Jesus, right? You want to be safe from the wrath of God against sin? You had to be sealed up inside of his provision, the ark. One door. God shuts it. You're safe. Jesus. That's Jesus. Another guy said, I think Jesus is the stairway man. I'm getting back to God by climbing the stairway man, he said. What story is he referring to there? Jesus said, you'll see the angels ascending and descending on me, the Son of Man. And every Hebrew heard Jacob's ladder, right? Bridge between the holy God and sinful man. And the Hoti guy, he didn't know how to express his faith. It was so beautiful because he didn't have a formulaic answer. He just knew that Jesus is my way back to God. And he's just like Jacob's ladder. And that's who I'm trusting in. It was just really beautiful. This is Naneo. He's the guy who pointed at the Bible and said, you know, whatever it says, that's what we believe. Let me read you a quick testimony of his. As we were leaving, one of the things I did is I went around and I just asked a bunch of guys, hey, just write something down for me. Or say it in my tape recorder. Anything you want to say about God is sort of like saying, give me a testimony. Because I told them after they kick us out and I'm back home, I want to be able to read these, you know, and remember what you guys said. And, and uh, this is, so this is what Naneo wrote down. He said, God's Spirit teaches my heart. If He didn't, I wouldn't have any good thoughts to write. But because He does teach me, I write it down, and this is what I wrote. It was very hoity how he's writing there. My people worshipped other gods behind whom Satan was at work, so we actually worshipped Satan. We were dead in Adam, and we sinned always, and God says that the sinner must die. Therefore, He should have killed us all and sent us all to the lake of fire. But he cared for us, and he gave his son to die on our behalf. He was angry with his son, Jesus. He beat him and cast him away, that in so doing he might save us. And so all who believe in the son are saved by God and made alive forever, and go to stay with him when they die. That's what I wrote, that's all I have to say. That's how the Hoti end everything, by the way. I've said everything I want to say. Then you know he's done. <laughs> I think that's a pretty neat little summary of, of Naneo's faith. And remember again what we're talking about here, that, that worldview grid and the impact that it has on their understanding. And if that truth can be communicated through that worldview grid, then you have some potential of them believing. Now let me, I have a few minutes left. I just want to share a couple things here with you. Uh, again, because we started by talking about the importance of discipleship, right? So discipling new believers, what's that going to look like? 
The word indigenous, which I'm sure you're familiar with, it means originating in and characteristic of a particular region or country, native. So an indigenous church is a native church. It's, it, in this case, it's the Hoti church. What's the Hoti church gonna look like? Let me ask you this, does the Hoti church have to look like my church? In some ways we would say yes, right? That what they believe and the principles of the local church and that God has laid, yeah, that needs to look the same. But how, how it actually is lived out and, and, and the flavor of it and what it looks like in that context might look very different. It needs to be their church, their faith, not a foreign religion or a foreign God understood in a foreign context. And this is where it can get really tricky for a missionary. And I, I'd say this is maybe one of the most challenging parts because as those young believers are, are maturing and developing into maturing believers, it's so tempting, excuse me, for the missionary to be guiding the process so much that you end up shaping everything to look like what looks familiar to you. Because, well then, it, I feel good about it, right? Because it looks what I'm, like what I'm familiar with. And I'm not saying that that's evil or terrible or something, but I think if you do that as a missionary, you're going to miss out on some big blessings. You're going to miss out on seeing what God would do if you would get your hands out of it and let God do what He wants to do. Just a couple examples from the Houthi context. Music, they didn't have music in their culture. He's playing a flute, but that wasn't native to the Houthi culture. That was learned. And when they started to, to understand that believers would sing to God as a way of praising Him, they wanted to know how to do that, but they didn't know how. So we made some choruses up and we taught them how to sing them. It was terrible. It sounded terrible. They didn't understand a melody or they couldn't sing, you know, the same word at the same time. Everybody was on a different word and everybody had their own melody and it's just noise. It sounded nothing like what you sounded like an hour ago, right? Just. You guys are light years down the road in your singing ability from where the Hoti were. But here's how it developed. They sang those songs that we helped them come up with for about, I don't remember, a couple few years. And then they came one day and they said, you know those songs you've been singing, we're tired of them. We have sung them to, to exhaustion is how you say it in the Hoti language. And I remember hearing that thinking, I thought that many times in my home church. I've just never had the courage to say it. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and they said, we have this idea. We just don't know if God would like it. Of course, you're all ears at this point. What are they going to say? They said, we have a whole bunch of God's word in our language. What if we sang that to him? Do you think he would like it? They said, what would you say to that? I think he'd like that. I can't, we can't speak for God. We're not God, but that sounds pretty good. So they would sing literally through the scriptures. If on Monday they sang chapter 1 of Matthew, Wednesday would be chapter 2, Friday would be chapter 3. They do that every other day all the way. Th and they just keep singing through that book, and then they pick another book. And if it's an 80-verse chapter that day, you're going to be singing for a long time because nobody ever learned the trick of saying, first five verses only today. <laughs> yeah, it was a totally foreign concept to them. I used to get out there and look, oh, 25 verses today. Whew. It's only going to be an hour and a half service today instead of three. <laughs> so they sang the scriptures for years. And then on one of my recent visits down there, after we were kicked out, I could still go into the city. We'd bring a few guys out and we'd do some discipleship and they'd go home. And on one of those visits, a guy pulled a notebook out of his bag. It was a little Walmart type notebook. And from front to back was just songs that they had written. You want to talk about something fun to read? That was fun to read. But he said this, he said, look, we've been, we've been thinking about singing again, and, we, and we'd like to sing some of these songs that we wrote. Will you make these into a book for us? So we printed up about 300 of those, and that's that yellow book you see in that picture. And I, I didn't take that picture. Again, that's one that was taken back in the village by them. And they're singing out of their hymn book now. And that's the Hoti music culture. Well, does that look like anything you're familiar with? You ever have the Lord's Supper with yellow sweet potato drink instead of something purple or red? Is that okay? Can you do that? What if the food culture has nothing purple or red in it? 
Uri Cabello came by the window one day and he said, hey, that eating and remembering thing, that's how we were describing the Lord's Supper, eating and remembering his, shed, his death, shed blood. That eating and remembering thing, we're going to do that on Wednesday, he said. We had never told him how to do it. And I remember thinking to myself, Ooh, how are you going to do that? What are you going to use for the cup and what are you going to use for the bread? They had no bread either. Fortunately, I was, I don't know, either not quick enough to think or I was or the Lord restrained me and I didn't say anything like I have a great idea come and get some Kool-Aid from me or something. just okay good I said can I come and they said yeah went out there and watched it and there they were they had made corn cakes that I had, they had never made them there was a new food invention for them they had taken corn and beat it down into cornmeal and made it into a corn cake and because it had to be something you could break we have to be able to break it and remember so can't be a boiled sweet potato that would just mush so they invented a food product. And then they used sweet potato drink for the cup. And Uri Cabello, in fact, here's a picture of Uri Cabello. He got up and he just, one thing was really clear in his mind, do this in memory of me. So he took everybody back to the cross and he just started talking through the, the death of Christ and what that was like and his broken body and his shed blood. And, and when he got done, he reached in that bowl and he grabbed one of those corn cakes and he just started walking around and breaking. Would you like to eat and remember? And Would you like to eat and remember? That was his catchphrase. I remember that. A couple of other guys grabbed and helped out. And I thought, well, this is what the Hoti community culture looks like. And, and let me go back to this picture. Uh, the cup, you know, I remember thinking, okay, everybody's going to drink out of that bowl. Everybody had a cold that day, by the way. And it was a nasty one. I remember it very well. I remember thinking, okay, whatever he says about that cup, I'm going to be first in line because <laughs> I'm not drinking after 30 people. And he said, he, when he got done, he said, okay, whoever would like to drink and remember his shed blood, come on up. And I scooted up the aisle. And Ralph, that's Ralph again, he was in the front row and he stood up and he beat me. And thank the Lord he did because I got to stand next to him and take that picture. And I want you to know what you're looking at there. That's the first Hoti speaking person, as far as I know, in the history of the world to pour something into a bowl that represents his Savior shed blood and drink it in memory of him. That's the first time the Lord's Supper happened with understanding. There's a Catholic village about 10 days north of us. I say a Catholic village. It's another settlement of about 300 to 400 Hoti people. There have been Catholic nuns living with them for as long as our mission has been with the Hoti in our valley. And they, they didn't speak any Hoti. The Hoti didn't speak any Spanish, but they would have them come do the, you know, put the wafer on the tongue thing and cross yourself. And So they sort of had, some of them had done this thing, but nobody understood it. None of them were believers. None of them understood it. This is the first time it ever happened with understanding. Now, I, I did save myself enough time to tell you this, what I heard last week, which I'm just really excited about. This guy in this picture, his name is Nale. Nare. Nare was not one of the original believers. Actually, yes, he was. But he came out of the jungle about two months before we started teaching the Bible. When I say came out of the jungle, I mean he had never seen an outsider. His clan was so backwoods, they didn't even have cloth loincloths. They hadn't seen matches. They were as backwoods as it could get. He came out just in time. He got in on the original teaching. He became a believer. Here he is a couple years later teaching literacy to the crowd. Here he is uh, after we left teaching Romans to the church. He became a, one of the best Bible teachers in the valley. On my last visit down there, he was one of the guys who came out, you know, and, and he, I don't know if he was the guy who brought the songbook out. It was one, him or the other two guys, I can't remember which. But not a, listen to that, okay, this, is, this, is, this is the cool part for me. When we left the valley in 2006, the Hoti had still never been able to go up to that Catholic village and share the gospel with them. In fact, for the, for the whole six years, they had been believers before we got kicked out. That was their biggest prayer request. Lord, how are we going to reach the Kayama people? So there's about 300 in our valley. There was about 300 in that Catholic village. And then there was about 1,000 or more scattered throughout the jungle. 
They wanted to go reach those Kayama people so bad, but those Kayama people were not interested in being taught by the Hoti from our valley. Their attitude towards the Hoti in our valley was, if anybody's teaching anybody, we're teaching you. They were sort of the advanced, you know, modern Hoti in their world. So there was no open door. So the Hoti, this was their conclusion. This is what they decided. We need to just start reaching out to the little Hoti groups all around us and we need to try to win their friendship up there and eventually maybe they'll let us teach. And we thought, that is pretty awful wise. And so they did that for years. And they've been reaching, I don't know how many by now it's been, little groups of Hoti that they've reached as missionaries. It's at least a dozen outreaches that they've done. About a year ago, the, the, the guys in our valley had been going up there and trying to make friends, but about a year ago, our guys in our valley hosted a soccer tournament, which blows my mind because they didn't even hardly know soccer back when we were there. It was totally new to them. But they thought, hey, they all like soccer up there. If we could have a soccer tournament down here, we could make, make them you know, friends of ours, and then maybe they'd let us share the gospel. They came, they had a soccer tournament. They started to tell them some about what they knew about God and would you believe then that the Kayama community officially opened, gave an open invitation for anybody who would like to come and teach, we want to hear. So about two months ago, five families went up there. And Nare is one of those teachers who went up there. Timoteo was one of the guys who went up there. That, that, oh, he's an old guy, he never was a teacher when we were there, but he's, going, he's up there teaching them. First I heard was 50 people were coming. Then I heard about four nights ago, 120 people are now coming to their teaching every day. And I wanted to close with this picture because we just heard last week that Nade's wife, Yolanda, they have five children. This is Nade's mother. This is his wife. She was giving birth up there. She was in labor for four days. They called for an emergency evac. The government did not respond and she died in childbirth. So here he is up there, right at the beginning of teaching this whole valley, and his wife dies. And, you know, we haven't heard, we don't get a lot of, you know, we're not getting a lot of regular updates, we're just hearing bits and pieces, but I've just been praying, Lord, give Nade the strength and the faith and the ability to, to use, to be able to use him in the midst of such tragedy to be, an example to these Kayama people of what a believer who knows where his wife went, how he deals with death. And it's just so exciting. I mean, we are, we've been coming out of our skin with excitement thinking of all those Kayama people finally hearing the gospel. Okay, I'll quit with this. There was about 150 believers when we first got finished with teaching the gospel. By the time we left, there was about 350 in the valley. All those others were reached by the Hoti believers, not by us. They continued to reach out, taking, I don't know how many believers are out there, and now the Kayamach people are finally being reached. It's pretty exciting. So the gospel and their worldview grid. And I'm just going to stop there. My time is up. Uh, thank you for the opportunity for the, the opportunity to share this. I'm looking forward to what we're going to hear after supper. So we'll stop there and turn it back over to Brian.